um, the third seminar of our series with uh, in collaboration with the Centre for Contemporary Women's Writing. Um, and it's the, uh, our series is entitled uh, Class Confinement and Criminality. Uh, so this is our third seminar. The first two were absolutely brilliant, really well attended, really rich discussions after. And we've been so happy with how it's been going and we're really excited for another brilliant seminar today. Uh, so we have two speakers who um, my co-organiser Jessica is going to introduce for us in a, in a moment. Um, but first, I'm just going to go over some Zoom house rules, if that's OK. I'm sure I'm repeating, we're repeating ourselves now because I'm sure this is this happens at every single Zoom event. But just to remind everyone, um, the session is being recorded so it can be uploaded to the IMLR website. Um, please feel free to turn your cameras off or on. However you feel most comfortable is totally fine. Um, so today's setup is as follows. We'll be having the two 15 minute papers and then a Q&A session after. Um, so if everyone could remain on mute um, until the time of the Q&A, that would be that would be fantastic. During the Q&A itself, if you'd like to ask a question, please, please feel free to uh, use the raise hand option um, and then you'll be asked to unmute. I think the raise hand icon is some, somewhere in participants. I think it's next to your own name in participants. Um, so that's where you can find that. Alternatively, you can just sort of, if you've got your um, video turned on, you can just physically raise your hand and we can find you that way. Um, you may also wish to remain on, anonymous or um, wish to sort of raise your hand in a different way by typing question into the chat box or just typing out your question into the chat box and then um, we, me or Jessica will ask the question on your behalf. Um, so I think that's everything um, that we need before we begin. Um, so otherwise, I'm just going to pass on to um, my co-organiser, Jess, Jessica Rushton, and she's going to introduce our first speaker of the morning. Good morning everybody, thank you all for being here and I'm so excited to hear our papers today. Our first speaker is going to be Dr Beatrice Ivey. She is a current postdoctoral research assistant in the School of Journalism at the University of Sheffield, working on radio in the Sahel and women's empowerment. She completed a PhD at Leeds in 2018 and is preparing a monograph for Liverpool University Press entitled Performative Pasts gender and transnational memory in French and Algerian literature, film and theatre. Her research interests concern gendered and feminist approaches to memory studies and transnational narratives of colonialism, French colonialism. Her French, uh, her French, her paper is titled Murder, Memory and Writing Other Women's Stories in Maïsa's Bay's uh, Nul Autre Voix, 2018. Thank you, Beatrice. Okay, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you so much, Shemaima, for... Um for organising this fantastic seminar series on top of everything else at a really stressful time. You've done such a great job. Um, I was really um, pleased to see the call for papers in particular because it did sort of inspire me to come back to this piece that I've started about a year ago and then haven't had the time to sort of do anything with. So this has forced me to sort of come back to this, um, to this novel um, in a really great way. Um, as ever, when we do, I'm going to quickly share my screen at the same time as I talk to you. Um, as ever, when you write an abstract, sometimes you're a bit over ambitious. So um, my, uh, the memory part of my title here, is that okay? Everyone can see it? Right. The memory part of my title here is going to be a bit more implicit rather than explicit in my analysis. But maybe this is something that we can look into more during the questions if there's time. Um, so, Murder Memory and Writing Other Women's Stories in Maïsa Bay's Nul Autre Voix. Um, as many of you will know, Maïsa Bay is a very well-known Algerian writer. And um, so, and this is actually my first time sort of addressing her works um, in my research. And so, uh, very much a work in progress. If you have any comments or feedback, I'd be really pleased to hear. Um, also, a bit of a content notice, you know, given the title of my, my paper, we will be talking about violence, we'll be talking about domestic violence as well. So I just wanted to make sure that's clear um, before we begin. Okay, so my Sabe is a pseudonym for Samia Benamur, who um, since the 1990s has been publishing a fiction in French, um, including sort of novels, um, short pieces, and also um, theatre. Um, throughout her work, she has privileged stories of resistance and survival in the face of violence, in particular focusing on the stories of women and young people in Algeria. Um, but in Nul Autre Voix, just try and 
move on to the next screen there. In order to um, I think this is the first time where Bay has actually staged the life of a woman who is the actor of violence. Um, this is the life of a woman who has killed her husband. Um, and while the act of murder is central to the plot, it is also a means to interrogate some themes that occur throughout Bay's work. Um, I think so the question of women's voice, uh, memory, uh, violence, of course, and the reconstruction of traumatic um, or unknowable pasts. Um, so this is more than just a murder mystery, I think, or not just, not to sort of put down the murder mystery here, but just to say that this isn't necessarily a, 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 like a, um, an example of crime fiction um, in that sense. Rather, the novel focuses on the singular voice of its narrator, an unnamed woman who re has recently been released from prison after serving 15 years for murdering her abusive husband. Finally free, she is socially ostracized by her neighbors, demonized as a monstrous woman, um, but also scrutinized as an object of curiosity. Um, but what's interesting about the text is where is how the narrator chooses to live um, her life in isolation as a form of kind of self-empowered confinement. Um, you know, after all, the point of prison is not just sort of isolation from society, but the deprivation of privacy. You have to live your life in close proximity to others and under constant surveillance. So once she's released from prison, she kind of is empowered by the ability to be alone. Um, um, but as, as I said, she's also the object of curiosity. And so a middle class writer named Faida um, picks up her case file and wants to start interviewing her for a novel she's going to write about a woman who kills her husband. And um, Faida is sort of everything that the, the unnamed narrator is not. She sort of represents the kind of idealized middle class femininity. She has a successful career yet she is also a mother and still embodies um, all the sort of feminine ideals of grace and beauty. Um, on top of that, the narrator struggles to find a way to insist on her ownership over the fluid, unstable, and sometimes contradictory memories of her life and her husband's murder. With every interview, with every encounter, she must renegotiate her ownership over her own words as she gifts them to another. And I think it is this desire to lay claim to her own story that encourages her to write in her own way through daily diary entries in her kani. And then she also writes letters to Fahida that remain unsent until the very end of the relationship. In this way, Bay crafts a narrative which is actually a kind of imagined dialogue between the narrator and the would-be narrator of the murderer's story. As readers, we become aware of this dialogue through the structure of the novel. So there are chapters that alternate between the letters directed at Farida and these more private, reflective entries in the narrator's carnet. And the information we get in one letter might actually contradict in, um, the information we get in, in the diary entries. So we're kind of alerted to a sense of performance here and are invited to be mistrustful of the story we are reading. In short, the narrative of the novel goes beyond the drama of the courtroom or of the murder scene these sort of central tropes of crime fiction. And the focus is instead is rather on this kind of mise en abîme and reversal of the relationship between author and subject. So, okay, um, I think I have about 10 minutes remaining because that was quite a long introduction. So I'm just going to mention two main points about the text. First, I'm gonna sort of look at Bay's representation of women who kill. And then second, I'm gonna move on to this question of narrative structure and how um, this raises issues around memory, storytelling and ownership. So, oh, and very quickly, very quick segue. Um, I want to acknowledge that's a huge amount of work going on um, about around Algerian crime fiction at the moment. And um, although I think this novel sort of sits on the periphery of Algerian crime fiction, um, it, kind, it kind of speaks to some of the themes that are going on. And I would um, point to the work being done by Nadia Hanem, who's got a great blog and a fantastic Twitter um, account where she sort of unpacks um, a lot to do with contemporary Algerian fiction, including uh, DZ crime fiction, Jazeera crime fiction. So, right, but returning to Nous l'autre um, fois. So there's this theme of monstrous women throughout the novel. Um, readers are given glimpses into the kind of abuse that the narrative, the nar narrator, sorry, received from her husband. And in various initial reviews of the novel, the narrator is kind of described as an anti-heroine. Um, so she is someone who sits ambivalently on the borders between victim and perpetrator of violence. So this is actually quite a common trope um, used in media and cultural representations of women who commit murder. So for examples within French and British canon, Lisa Downing and Lizzie Seal, among others, 
have produced work on this gendering of, narrat of narratives of women who kill as kind of both monstrous aberrations of feminine norms and victims, victimized anti-heroes anti at the same time. And I think their work sort of draws on Barbara Creed and in turn Chris Dover and et cetera. So I won't be able to go into that in too much detail, but just, um, just want to highlight there's a lot of work being done on that. Um, Indeed, following the murder of her husband, the narrator is accused of being a monster on several occasions, even by her own defense lawyer. So the first person narrative um, voice doesn't actually reject these labels, but sort of ruminates on her own monstrosity. At one point she ironizes that her story is the kind you would tell children as a scary bedtime tale. But what is it about her that really makes her a monster? Um, she connects this with the ways in which her actions have always so, seemed to, deem to transgress the norms of femininity. Uh, she says, Les femmes ne tuent pas, elles donnent la vie. C'est même la principale fonction génitrice. Tout tentative de sortir de ce schéma fait d'elle des monstres, des femmes en hommes. Je présente donc deux anomalies. Je n'ai pas d'enfant et j'ai ôté la vie à un homme. So here, the woman who kills in Bay's narrative reflects on how she was condemned to sort of be monstrous long before she killed her husband. She was associated with the criminal, with the transgressive, through the fact that she didn't have children. In her private writing, she recalls the verbal abuse that she received from her husband that condemned her in such a way to being nothing through her seemingly failed femininity. Rien, rien, tu n'as rien d'une femme. Il me disait souvent, regarde-toi, mais regarde-toi, tu ne ressembles à rien. So returning to the sociologist Lizzie Seal, um, she argues that after a murder, the trial is, um, sorry, the societal goal is to return to the kind of heteronormative hegemonic order um, that has been undone by the wielding of violence, extreme violence by a woman. And this is the role that, trial, that the trial plays because it's kind of a, a performative and collective condemnation of the perpetrator of violence. Um, and I think, whereas in, in Bay's novel, the monstrous woman who kills kind of rationalizes her own criminality as a continuation of, rather than a rupture with, the monstrous woman who does not perform the ideal feminine role of genitrice um, by remaining child free. So she doesn't see this as an aberration of her per perception within society, but kind of a continuation of it. Um, if the trial is supposed to establish the narrator's monstrosity, the author is actually seeking evidence of the narrator's status as a victim of violence, which makes the narrator feel quite uneasy as this isn't who she is anymore. She says, Il m'est pénible de donner de moi l'image de cette femme humiliée, terrorisée, tremblante, dans laquelle je ne me reconnais plus aujourd'hui. Je ne veux pas exciter la pitié, et surtout pas la sienne. So, the narrative of victimization is, again, in stories about women who kill, kind of plays into this return to heteronormative hegemonic order in that it reinstates familiar gendered norms about victimization as an inherent condition of women's lives. And the, the, narrative, the narrator in the novel has a kind of cheesy line about why is it always la victime, you know, this is sort of feminization of victimhood. Um, in this way, the encounter with the writer does not sort of depart from the dominant narratives of victimization and monstrosity surrounding women who kill in ways that we might expect. We kind of expect there to be some sort of feminine solidarity between these two women. Um, but this does explain why the narrator feels so compelled to tell her own story. Um, so this leads me to my second point, moving on from representations of women who kill to the sort of reconstruction of the past through st storytelling. Um, ultimately, Bay's engagement with the drama of the murder tackles the question of who gets to tell the story of the crime. The narrator is very aware of the power that comes with the, with the written word. In prison, she exerted her own class privilege, as she could read and write, by acting as a scribe for some of the other women inmates, gathering and mediating their stories, writing their letters. Jeti sel ki li, je fou sel ki ikri, kativa. So this is the only name we have for the narrator. It's a nickname, Katiba, and I'm not an Arabic speaker, but it sounds very similar to the word for book in Arabic, Katiba. So, and also on, on top of that in Arabic, there is this associative connotation between the verb to write and the noun fate, maktub, uh, which imbues the nar narrator with a form of power that wasn't afforded to her by the act of violence that took her husband's life. And so herself and the, and the inmates sort of, sort of repeat over and over again this, the sort of you know, this idea of fate of, of what will be will be. And so she quotes this often saying, um, 
So we can see how writing kind of gives the narrator an identity and she feels empowered by her ability to write for the other women. But what happens when another woman, Fahida, enters her life with an offer to write her story? The narrator becomes very conscious of what will happen to her story once it is rewritten and transformed into another's. Et ainsi, pièce à pièce, vous allez reconstituer ma vie comme on reconstitue une scène du crime, she says. So she's associating Farida with the kind of classic detective character in a, in a crime fiction novel. She's there to, you know, identify all the evidence and put everything back into a linear narrative so it makes sense. But she sees this as a kind of theft, so she also says, Vous sauterez de ma vie après avoir volé la mienne. Voler n'est pas peut-être Euh, n'est pas peut-être pas le mot qui convient, c'est de détournement qu'il s'agit puisque vous en serez seul bénéficiaire. So it's this kind of idea that, you know, she gets nothing from this storytelling. This is someone, this is an extractive relationship that she has with Farida. Um, in interviewing the narrator, Farida's aim is ostensibly to extract the facts of the narrator's life and reconstruct them so that they become legible to a reader to explain the murder, to satisfy an audience's morbid fascination. In reading these letters to Farida and the journal entries for herself, um, in writing, sorry, these letters to Farida and the journal entries for herself, the narrator interrupts and destabilizes the process of reconstruction. She can also write back to the writer, allowing for a performative dialogue to take place that very self-consciously untangles the ethics of writing about and for other women. And, you know, this is, she's obviously, Farida is obviously like a stand-in for Bay as well, so this is what I mean by the sort of self-reflective kind of um, process. She says, um, Le tout parsemé de, de ces ingrédients qui font aujourd'hui le succès d'un livre, Femme Batou, harcèlement moral et plus largement condition de la femme, sans oublier quelques scènes de sexe. So, there's self reflexive ironization about what makes a book successful and today, you know, what, what, how do we market a book? It's very typical, I think, of Bay's writing in general, which always has like an eye on, fixed on what she's doing. Uh, as a writer and I think she shares this very performative self-reflection with a, a major influence in her work and this is, won't be surprising to anyone um, but Asi Jabbar who also um, you know thought through the very problematic act of giving voice quote-unquote to the voiceless which could easily slip into the effacement of the voices the narrative hopes to empower so in Femme d'Alger uh, dans le département she stresses the need to speak alongside other women as opposed to speaking in their place she says so this is the quote from Jabbar uh, ne pas prétendre parler pour ou pire parler sur à peine parler près d'eux et si possible tout contre and this is a very famous quote though you know this is not I'm not the first person to compare Bay and Jabbar, but I think it, it resonates with what's going on in this novel. Um, so for the narrator of Nula Tovoa, her proximity to the writer exposes the delicate before power dynamics between two women who write. Um, right, I've probably run out of time, but I've got a sort of kind of conclusion. Um, Bay has uh, long advocated for storytelling as a feminist praxis, as a way of seeking justice for the wrongs committed against women and other oppressed groups who transgress the norms of patriarchal societies in which they live. And um, so this is from a quote way back in 2004 with another writer, um, Abdel Majid Kawa, um, where she says, La parole des femmes est souvent une parole arrachée aux autres, conquise, mais en même temps arrachée de soi. Car elle implique, elle implique une mise à nu, un dévoilement, même si, par les détours de la fiction, le jeu de l'être avance masqué. And I think this might chime with reading Mireille's abstract. I think this might chime a little bit with the with the paper to come as well. This idea of sort of unveiling and revealing through writing. Um, so between the letters and the diary entries, the narrative of Nous l'autre voix stages the process by which the narrator is able to wrest the way this process of arracher, um, her voice from Farida. Ultimately, it is the criminal, not the writer, who finishes her story. Indeed, Farida's promise to create something new from the criminal's testimony has evaporated by the end of the novel. She sort of disappears, taking the fragments of the criminal's words with her. Nonetheless, the narrator finds triumph and ownership um, by narrating her own story in her own way. The novel ends with a mixture of resistance, self-affirmation and foreboding threat as she addresses Farida but also the reader by saying Eh, ne l'oubliez pas, ce livre m'appartient autant qu'à vous.
Therefore, while reading and writing have long been considered an act of militancy and liberation for Algerian women, even for those writing in French, Bay introduces the complex ethics of writing by interrogating the jealous, territorializing, and even predatory aspects of writing about Algerian women. Bay exposes these dynamics in a way that is ingrained in the necessary work to repeat the works of, words of Asya Jabbar of speaking to contre the voices of other women, while acknowledging the power dynamics at play, even in that act of solidarity. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beatrice. That was such a thought-provoking uh, paper, and I'm really looking forward to the um, Q&A later when we can go further into depth in some of your ideas. You. Um, so if we're ready, then, um, we're going to do speaker two now, which is Mireille Rebez, who is an assistant professor of Francophone Studies and Women and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Dickinson College in the state of Pennsylvania. A huge thank you to um, Mireille because um, she is doing this from America at what time is it now about five o'clock um, yeah 5 23 so a huge thank you to her dedication here um she published several articles in french and english and her manuscript gendering civil war francophone women's writing in lebanon is currently under consideration by edinburgh university press her paper is titled from darkness to spotlight how magical realism brings women out of confinement into the light in des ombres. so thank you so much Take it away. Um, first, um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the organizers. And um, I just want to say that my colleague, I see Marda Messe, she's in Boston, uh, Simmons College. So uh, you have two people from the United States, I think. I, I don't know where the rest of you are from, but thank you, Marda, for showing up. I know it's really early for us. Um, the second thing I want to say is I come from Beirut, Lebanon, and I do want to take a second and recognize the blast that happened in Beirut. It's the largest non-nuclear blast in the in the world. And um, I'll kindly ask you if you'd consider donating for the Lebanese Red Cross. That, that would mean greatly. Um, now to business. Um, I, um, I'm going to read to you and try not to bore you to death uh, with my analysis of L'Armoire des, des Ombres. Uh, so it was published in 2006 by a Lebanese writer named Hiam Yared, and the title translates into The Wardrobe of Shadows and basically tells the story of a divorced uh, Lebanese woman who is desperate to pay rent, so she auditions for a leading role in a play. We don't, need the we don't know the name of the, of the woman who's also the narrator. So she goes on stage and she's scared. Um, as she gets into the dressing room, um, the uh, the staff ask her to take off her shadow and she's puzzled by that what do you mean take off my shadow and they insist please take off your shadow and then she realized that actually you can remove your shadow so she removes her shadow and once she gets on stage she finds that there's just a wardrobe there and then she opens the wardrobe and it's full of other shadows and she starts putting them on and as she's putting them on you know each shadow on its own um, she starts telling the stories of these shadows. And this is where we encounter the shadow of Greta, the prostitute, Lena, the lesbian bartender, and Mona, the abused wife. Um, the lives of these women and the life of the narrator gradually become connected. And the reader comes to realize at the end that actually all these women are one. They represent the Lebanese women in the, in, during the civil war in Lebanon and the post-war period. Uh, the fragmentation of time and space and stories, along with the uncanny elements of removing one's shadow and finding a wardrobe full of shadows, create the mysterious environment that is typical to magical realism. So magical realist theater becomes the space of freedom where women's confinement is exposed and where raw truth is told um, and put on the spotlight. So the genre of magical realism, Yared, so the writer, takes women out of their closed spaces and shed the light on their lives to expose women's oppression in Lebanon. But first, before we delve into the analysis of um, the, the novel itself, I would like to remind you what magical realism is as a genre. Of course, you know, the grandiose visibility of magical realism came in 1967 with Gabriel Garcia Marquez and the 100 Years of, Sol uh, 100 years of Solitude. The genre existed before that in art from 1925. And there is a major discussion in the field, whether it's a post-colonial field or post-modern field. Just to remind everybody, a post-colonial, it examines the conflicted relationship between colonizer and colonized, the hegemony of, uh, of colonial culture in the post-colonial world, 
Postmodernism focuses more on textual features such as time, space, narrative voice, historical elasticity, but also the relationship between the real and the fiction. Um, what is magical realism in itself? Um, it's a hard, it's a genre that is hard to classify because it varies between the marvelous, the fantastic. It, these genres bleed into each other. It is a literally, it is a literary genre that defies reason and goes beyond the laws of nature. It superposes different worlds and allows the coexistence of time and spaces to which the reader does not belong. The reader is often positioned outside the magical realist world, and when invited in, the reader is placed in an uncomfortable position as he or she will have to suspend the Cartesian way of thinking in order to fully grasp the magical realist experience. That is to say, in order to understand madness, one has to be mad. In Ordinary Enchantments, Magical Realism and the Remystification of Narrative, Wendy B. Ferris provides a detailed analysis of the genre and identifies five primary traits that go into the construction of magical realism. And I quote, first, the text contains an irreducible element of magic. Second, the descriptions in magical realism detail a strong presence of the phenomenal world. Third, the reader may experience some unsettling doubts in an effort to reconcile two, contra two contradictory understandings of events. Fourth, the narrative merges different realms. And finally, magical realism disturbs received ideas about time, space, and identity, end of quote. And we will see that these elements are heavily available in the text itself. The text opens up on this irreducible element of magical realism. When the unnamed narrator goes to the audition, she, she tries to take her shadow with her. Nobody talks like this. Nobody's saying, here I go off to work and here comes my shadow with me. When she gets to the theater, the staff tells her to remove her, her shadow. Thus, the element of magical realism is promptly introduced in, uh, in the, um, to the unprepared reader. It is inserted in the real world as if it, as if it were always part of it. Consequently, the ordinary and the extraordinary coexist right from the beginning. And while the reader may find, it, uh, uh, may find it difficult to fully penetrate the narrator's world, the narrator herself accepts her magical reality and, and agrees the, to the theater's request to remove shadows. Once on stage, the narrator pulls different shadows from the wardrobe. Wearing them, she tells their story. The first shadow to remove is her mother's. She tells us that her mother finds her bizarre and disappointing. She's disappointed in her because one, she is born female, not male. She is different than other Lebanese girls, more traditional, and she, she's divorced. The narrator tells us that um, she has always been interested in studying shadows because she's seen so many dead shadows during the war. She's seen so many shadows cry during the war. And it fascinated, since her, it fascinated her since her childhood. She also liked her own shadow when she wears stiletto shoes. She felt that her shadow is powerful, strong, feminine. Her mother was horrified. She called her a slut. She confiscated her shoes and gave her flat shoes instead. The mother-daughter relationship declines even more when the narrator gets a divorce. Her mother blames her for her failed marriage. Had she followed the road that had been traced for her? Had she walked in the shoes of traditional Lebanese girls? Had she not paid attention to her shadow and stiletto shoes? she wouldn't be divorced today. From this magical space of theater and shadows, the narrator criticizes the role of mothers who act as guardians of the patriarchal values. Mothers are the agency that train their daughters to accept their social roles and to obey social requirements and expectation without questioning them. By clinging to her shadow, the narrator objects to her mother's oppression. She refuses to fit in the shoes that were made for her and refuses and rejects the culture that she called the sheep culture and the culture of yes. It's the culture that approves everything without questioning. The second shadow the narrator takes out of the confinement of the wardrobe is of Marguerite, nicknamed Greta. Sexually assaulted at 16 by her neighbor, Marguerite runs away from the violence of her brother, Tony, who believed the neighbor over her. She finds refuge in the convent. She's pregnant. She, she stays in the convent till she gives birth, and then she's asked to leave. When she leaves, because she's illiterate, the only job she can find is selling her body. The third shadow belongs to Lena, a lesbian bartender who works at the bar with Greta. For a time during the war, Lena was married to a British doctor who worked uh, for Doctors Without Borders. Their marriage was never consummated, as Lena was afraid of intercourse. After 10 years of marriage, her husband left her and Lena became a bartender. She says that she, ser she likes serving illusions to clients, but she's also deeply in love with Greta. The foreshadow is Monaz. 
Her parents died in a car accident and she was in the custody of her grandparents. Her father is from the South and comes from a very wealthy family. Her mother comes from the North of Lebanon and comes from a humble family. Um, and her, her grandparents despise her for her, parent, her mother's origins. And as such, they abuse her. And to run away, she marries the, her father's uh, cousin, who turns out to be even more abusive. After having two children with him, she starts taking the contraceptive pill. She did not want any more kids. And when her husband finds out, he beats her. She goes to the police to file a complaint. The police does not believe her. And as such, they suggest that she must have done something to deserve the beating. Um, aided by a friend, Mona escapes to Cyprus where she leads a successful life and then gets pregnant without being married from her Greek boyfriend. The shadows of Greta, Lina, and Mona come out of their confinement into the magical space of theater. And it's only that, then that they become visible to the audience and the reader. On the surface and in the real world, Greta, Lina, and Mona are a prostitute, a lesbian, and a bartender, and a, um, and a pregnant unmarried woman. Deep down in the darkness of their shadows, they are much more than this. And they represent, represent all the untold stories of sexual assault, physical and verbal abuse against women. By ending the confinement, by shedding the light on their shadows, which is interesting because she's shedding light on shadow, which is a very, it's oxymoron, right? Um, by putting them on stage, the narrator reveals the reality of these women in their pasts, presents, and futures. She traces their identity in a way that gives them a sense of dignity. The reader at this point can no longer be judgmental of these women and dismiss their story. The reader can only sympathize with them um, as they have been deeply wronged and misunderstood by the real world. The ambience of magical realism reaches its climax toward the end of the text when the narrator comes to realize while performing on stage that all the shadows she had encountered are in fact hers. In other words, she is all these women. The narrator is simultaneously the oppressed daughter, the raped sister, the abused wife, the lesbian lover, and the illiterate prostitute. Despite their differences and irrespective of their religion and sexual orientation, these women have one thing in common. They were all confined. Their oppression occurred in different times and spaces and comes from their mothers, fathers, brothers, grandparents, spouses, neighbors, and the society as a whole during both the war period and after the war period. The multiplicity of the narrator's identity allows for these experiences to become shared ones. The narrator is no longer alone. In fact, no woman is alone anymore. All women become one as a group with similar stories in the realm of magic. The stage is the space on which the deconfinement or the coming out takes place. However, there is a certain danger that is associated with it. In the female grotesque risk, excess, and modernity, Mary Russo shows the danger that society has assigned to women in public space. A woman might, and I quote, make a spectacle out of herself, end of quote, which means that she might inadvertently expose herself and act beyond the boundaries of her gender. The narrator of L'Armoire des Ombres seems to be fully aware of this danger and is willing to run the risk of making a spectacle out of herself in the name of woman's right. The stage thus become, becomes not only the space for the narrator's metamorphosis and, um, and not only her gateway into magical realm, but also her subversive space from which she positioned herself higher than the rest of society because she's above everybody or, or even the audience and into the light to expose issues that Lebanese society regards as taboo. And I conclude from here, from her stage, she openly talks about sex, rape, physical and verbal abuse, reproductive rights, and many other topics that are traditionally confined into the private space. By exposing herself, by making a spectacle out of herself, she brings into the light issues that have been long hidden in the shadows of Lebanese society. With carnivalesque spirit, she breaks the border between public and private and creates a world of magic where women are placed on stage and as a priority. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant, Mille. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was just trying to find my unmute button there. That was brilliant. I always think it sounds a bit strange without any applause at the end. <laughs> so virtual applause for you. Um, so I'm going to start off the Q&A with um, a question that's popped up from Shirley Jordan here. Um, just going to get stuck straight in, if that's OK, with both of our speakers. So um, Shirley has a question for both speakers. Um, and she says she's interested in how both papers bring us to think about the slippage between accounts of reality. And she asks, what does this slippage tell us about writing women's experience? I don't know if either of you have any thoughts about that. 
I can I can go first to give Mireille some time like, perhaps to read the question. Um, there's a really yeah I, I like that that common um, strand between the two papers as well that both are sort of both these texts are clearly invested in how um, women's writing also mediates reality and so for I think in Nous l'autre au revoir the um, this really concerns the, the the I mean like with all crime fiction the uh, what's at the heart of it is what happened during the crime. What 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 is the truth of the of the murder? Um, and what um, Maisa Bay I think is and she's not so interested in that and from the crime fiction perspective because the opening prologue is the murder itself. It's very clear that the narrator murdered her husband while she was watching TV. Um, so we're not under any kind of uh, there's no mystery. Um, at the heart of the text. What is mysterious is how um, then the um, narrator, how the, how the criminal chooses to sort of mediate her own reality. And we're not sure really of the facts around her life because she's playing with the author as the author is interviewing her. She's being really reticent about the, the facts that the author is looking for so that she can in turn mediate her truth. Um, She's, she's withholding information. She refuses to tell her the details of sort of the sexual violence or the domestic abuse that she that she received as a kind of excuse for for the murder. Um, but then she tells all in the uh, carnet that she writes to herself. You know that alternates between these letters to Farida and and whatnot. So there's this kind of um, doubling effect that takes place. And she described the narrator describes as well how she feels. Um, yeah, this kind of doubling in that, in that she feels herself being turned into a fictional character at the same time as she's telling her stories to, to um, uh, Fida. So obviously this kind of interplay between fact and fiction is at the heart of this, this narrative. Um, the one other thing I would say about it is this, um, the, the, the novel's really invested in this idea of performance and performativity, which is why I also really like it, because that's sort of when, what my research background is in. Um, the other aspect of the opening prologue, which I, I find really fascinating, is that it's a short, relatively short section. It's only a couple of pages long, but the phrase "je dis," like I say, I, I state, with, with, with the, followed by a semicolon, is repeated seven times across this prologue. So there's this real sort of sense of theatricality to it. She kind of describes the murder scene as a stage play. She's setting the scene for this murder to take place, which again is another kind of commonality with Murray's uh, piece, of course, is theatricality of women's writing. Um, and I, yeah, so I, I, I really like this kind of um, self-reflexive performative mediation that goes on in the text between this search for truth that what actually happens during the crime that is so common to crime fiction and then what goes on so often in women's writing where it's like well we can't know the truth it's unknowable it's so traumatic so we have to pay attention to the silences or to the you know the performativity of things that you know what what is done through speech or what is not done through speech and things like that so i hope that makes sense that was brilliant thank you i was just scribbling down my own note there thank you beatrice um Mireille, I don't, I don't know if you have... Yeah, I, I do have a... I mean, it's a, it's a quick comment. Um, uh, I, I just want to uh, thank Shirley for the suggestion about the book. I don't know it. I'll look it up. Um, but um, to follow up on the question and Beatrice's comment, um, I would add that the slippage for um, L'Armoire des Ombres, or the, the text that I analyzed, between, magical realism is the space for su the subaltern or marginalized voices to speak up. And um, it's it's very interesting to think that women in real life cannot speak up, they're, they're not heard. But if, if they create a space that is magical or fictional or detached from reality, they can. Um, so th this is why it's it's a shelter, right? It's a, they they seek that space to speak up against conservative value, patriarchal value, traditional values, and so on and so forth. And um, and it's interesting because this genre has been has been around for a while, but also has been the space for minorities and um, whether wh however you want to define minority, whether it's, um, I know in England you define it differently, but I'm thinking like in, in terms of American categories, like I'm thinking of queer categories, LGBTQ, uh, people of color, uh, able differently. So magical realism has always been that space 
um, a third space for folks that are do not identify with mainstream or Eurocentric to speak up. And particularly in the case of the Middle East um, or Arabic voices or Lebanese voices, particularly for women. Uh, but this is also co a comment on realism. Realism has been monopolized by white males 19th century and versus um, women find an, an alternative reality from which to speak up. So it's a safe space for women to speak up from to counter the mainstream Eurocentric reali uh, realism genre that existed from the 19th century. Thank you so much, Mireille. I'm so glad you mentioned the 19th century because that's what I was starting to think. Well, yeah, actually, there's quite a lot yeah. of like sort of male writers at that point. Yeah. Um, we've got another question uh, from Nia Parrish. Um, who says, uh, thanks Beatrice, that's really interesting. Could you tell us a little bit more about how memory works in the text? Is it linked to this idea of mediating truth? Thank you, Nina. Um, yes, absolutely, it is. I think um, all memory is mediated. All memory is an act, it's something that, you know, you, it's, not, it's not necessarily um, an essentialist truth, obviously, and so that's, and it comes, this becomes legible through fiction. Um, and I think that what um, Maisa Bay is doing in this text is, like she does with so many of her texts, um, is sort of perform the past. She does the past and she cr creates these scenarios where um, different actors, uh, whether it be historical actors um, or sort of, like, as in this text, you know, actors around the scene of a crime, um, can come into encounters with each other and then um that past can like sort of play out um through this this performance of different roles so um and i think what i i like about the text as well and this probably relates to obviously your work on on memory is a sort of move away from the kind of cosmopolitan uh, memory which is based on valuing um for a very good reason, the perspectives of victims as a sort of an excavation of the past in order to restore the voices uh, of victims, um, which is very necessary um, work and associated with sort of Second World War and post-conflict situations and, and whatnot. And what, what Maisa Bay is doing is sort of, because she's done this in a lot of her texts, she's sort of looked at the interplay between victim narratives and perpetrator narratives. So one of the other texts, which is again a very well-read and well-studied uh, it's, it's a great text to teach, I think, um, that I wanted to compare with this one is Entendez-vous dans les montagnes, where um, Bay, yeah, so it's kind of recognising the, in the group, um, Bay stages this encounter between um, someone who kind of stands in as a biographical proxy for herself, so the daughter of someone who was martyred during the Algerian Revolution, um, and a, a French appelé and the granddaughter of a Piennois, all in conveniently meet up in a, in a carriage and a train from Paris to, to from Marseille to Paris. And she ironizes that fact as well. She's very self-aware. Um, and in that relationship, in that conversation that, that, that occurs with, between these three characters, there's this sort of really uncomfortable encounter between the perpetrator and the victim of violence. And in Nulo Tovoir, we have that encounter in one person. We have that encounter in the sort of um, the character of the, the woman who kills. Um, and she's sort of playing with memory as a way of, you know, unpacking these kinds of narratives, I think, about around victims. I say women as victims and women as perpetrators of violence and the different sort of tropes associated with that. Um, I, I think what I need to do going forward is really try and nail down that question of memory in this text because I'm used to talking about historical memory, I think, and this is more, uh, this is a text where Maisa Bay is not necessarily interested in historical memory, although she does, um, the, the narrator does reflect on the uh, Black Decade and the conflicts of the 1990s and sort of the injustices that took place during that decade and the irony of the fact that she kills her husband and she's the one that goes to jail. Um, I mean, I don't think she's defending murder, might have been generally, but she, there's a kind of tension there between the sort of wider societal injustices and corruption in Algeria that Bay identifies and the life story of this one woman. Um, so, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said about memory, personal memory, historical memory um, in the text, but it's all through mediated through different forms of performance, I think.
agonistic memory thank you that was what i forgot i was like it cosmopolitan memory and then conflicting memory i forgot the agonistic thank you nina brilliant thank you beatrice um, we've got another question for Mireille now, um, coming from Marda. Um, and she says, can you comment on how Mona seems to find freedom, in quotations, away from Lebanon? Absolutely. I, I just, I just want to say before answering this question that in a way I didn't do the book justice because this is part of, um, this analysis is part of my book. And um, in my book, I do analyze each story on its own. But in, in, in the span of 15 minutes, I couldn't go into the details of each story. And there is there is different aspects also to discuss. Like there is the sexuality aspect. Um, Greta finds freedom and this, you know, explosive, excessive sexuality um, of, you know, selling her body. Um, uh, um, Lena um, finds the freedom in non-normative sexuality. She's lesbian. And Mona finds uh, freedom by not being married, by being engaged uh, in a relationship that is not conforming to traditional standards, which is heterosexual, being married, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and it's unfortunate because um, many, many um, women writers um, find shelter away from home. Nul ne profite dans son pays, right? Like they, 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 they have to leave. And then they become this kind of a deterritorialized voice that speak about Lebanon from other spaces. So uh, Mona finds the freedom away from Lebanon that, and she becomes a successful businesswoman as well uh, in Cyprus. But the interesting part, which is, which is a sad reality, which is a sad reality because many of the resistance for women's rights happen from outside the space itself rather than inside it. I don't want to deny the, the resistance that's happening inside, but it's, it is a commentary that is very valid one, that the freedom is found outside. And this outside voice becomes the voice that is the strongest and um, the most vocal. But what is interesting is, is that in the novel, um, people in Lebanon hear that Mona is pregnant without being married, and they started calling her the disease. Um, uh, and they started saying, like, they start protesting against her and saying that we need to uh, bring down Mona, and they spell it M dot O dot, like as if it's acronym for a disease. So women pregnant outside the marriage is also a disease. So there's a whole commentary about sexuality. But it is a valid point, um, to say that freedom sometimes for women that come from conservative spaces is actually found outside the space of resistance rather than inside it. Thank you, Mireille. Um, so another question for Beatrice uh, from Hannah. Uh, where, the narr where the narrator identifies the writer, Farida, as a kind of detective using writing as an extraction, is there any self-identification by the narrator when she is writing that she is she too is doing detective work or is her reading slash writing when in prison more of a work of solidarity with the other women in the same position as her um thank you so much hannah for your question um may i just um say something about Marie's comment there um before i move on to yeah, carry on. this, this it came to me that I, I, whilst you were speaking, Maria, I totally agree with what you were saying. This this idea of sort of finding um, sexual empowerment away from spaces, yeah. and I just wanted to really quickly say that in Nola Tovar, um, basically the through this empowered self confinement, the um, the writer is finally sort of enjoyed like sexual fulfillment. She learns basically how to masturbate on her own for the first time in her own apartment and obviously in prison she was never able to do that in, in privacy in her relationship with her husband she never had any kind of sexual fulfillment so there's this strange kind of empowerment that she, she she gets through being on her own in this apartment it just resonated with me what you were saying about sort of mm -hmm. being away but she's on her own uh, among others sort of in this apartment in a, a, like it's an anonymous urban city in 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 Algeria, we're not sure where, but but going to um, Hannah's question. Thank you so much. It, yeah, that's a really good point because I suppose that's the tension I'm trying to raise. It's like, what's the difference between um, the narrator who gets dubbed Ketiba being a scribe for her fellow inmates, using her privilege there to mediate their voices, and then Faida coming along with her own a different kind of privilege um, and mediating uh, the narrator's story. And I 
think that in the narrator's view, um, and maybe we could see this from, you know, going back to Jabai, is that um, she's sort of using her ability to read and write just to write, literally don't write down the words of her inmates as an act of solidarity because they don't have the ability to do that. So there's a kind of still problematic sort of, I don't know, disparity between their sort of class privileges, but within the space of the prison, that becomes a survival technique for the narrator and also a way to sort of just, you know, show solidarity with the other inmates who can't read or write and so that they communicate with their loved ones outside. Um, whereas she can read and write, so when Farida comes along and asks to write her story on her behalf, she suddenly realizes, well, this is something I could do myself. And that's the that's the that's the crux of the novel, really. Is that's that process of of that dialogue between the two potential narrators of the story. Who's going to who's going to really tell the story? And um, it's suggested by the end of the novel that Farida will write this story. She will write um, this this novel about a woman who kills her husband. Um, but but uh, the narrator nonetheless feels empowered and sort of. Um, uh, she finds resilience, I think, through through the act of writing as well. Um, but your question also made me think how um, think about how Bay herself identifies with Farida, because obviously she's also, she's also a well educated middle class um, Algerian writer who's also a university teacher, like the character in the in the novel. So I think there's a kind of self reflexive relationship there. She's really exploring her own. Um, relationship to the subjects that she writes about in the novel as well but really it's a really extreme example obviously this this example of, of women who kill um okay i'm gonna leave it there i've got a really quick question just on that before we move on um just wondering when because um when you talk about her writing the stories of the other female prisoners do we gain the sense in the text that she's very open and honest that she's saying i'm not changing their stories i'm not fictionalizing them is, is she quite open in that sense or I think so. Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, I think so because, um, but then she's not a reliable narrator either. So um, thinking about it, she could, that could be part of the deception. Um, because we, as I said, there, between the letters and the, the her di diary entries in the canade, like she, there are, there, there are sort of, she saw, I told Fida this one thing and it, that didn't happen. You know, that kind of thing. So, um, or your fire alarm's going off again. <laughs> no, no, it's just my laptop. I don't know okay. what's going on. Um, so, so there's this, um, yeah, I think she tells us that she was an honest scribe, that she she just wrote down um, the stories as she had, and that she wrote the letters as they were um, sort of communicated to her. Um, but we learn through the narrative structure of the novel that she can't always be trusted or that there's this question again of mediated memory and you know what actually happened versus um how she's sort of performing it in through the text so um yeah that's something i need to think about a little bit more thank you thank you um our next question then oh, we've got quite a few nice comments coming in here um do, do, do. we haven't read this one is it uh from rebecca a question for Beatrice. I seem to remember that the narrator criminel finds a degrees of solidarity solidarity in prison with other women who have similar experiences to her and who have also been silenced in various ways. I wouldn't I was wondering whether you could comment on the seeing seeming paradox of uh, seeming paradox of confinement in small spaces enabling narrative freedom. On a second note, I was wondering whether there's a parallel with forgive my pronunciation of this, Noelle El Saadoui's Woman at Point Zero. Yeah. Um, with regards to Woman at Point Zero, I'll have to just look at that text a little bit more closely, but thank you very much for the, for the reference and, the, and the, the idea. I'll definitely follow that up. Um, absolutely, there's a paradox between this idea, I think, of confinement. There are different forms of confinement in the novel. There's the the confinement in the prison, which is obviously a deprivation of privacy. Uh, you know, you're constantly being surveyed. You're, you're never alone when you're in prison. And her, the freedom that she finds by being completely alone as she, uh, by choice, on her own in her apartment, not talking to her neighbours, and her neighbours are you know, quite hostile to her as well, um, not really leaving her apartment unless to go to uh, the shops, which is obviously a very familiar experience for all of us now. Um, but there's this 
yeah, so there is this paradox there, but like returning to the, to the, the point I made earlier about her sort of ability to explore new ways of living in her confinement through her sexuality is a kind of a way of her exploring freedom whilst in confinement. But that question of paradox is, is something I'll, I'll definitely look into more. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice, and thank you for back for that question and that reference. Um, just looking here at the chat, of course, as well, do feel free, feel, feel free to um, raise your hand and wave at any point if you, if you have a question you'd like to ask in person. Um, so we've got a comment from Chris, just to add to Hannah's question, so this is from Beatrice from before. Um, uh, Chris was struck by similarities between the structure in Nul Autre Voix and aspects of Hygiene de l'Assassin by Notom. So storytelling, memory, truth, uncovering realities, different versions of the truth, etc. And another crime fiction test where the whodunit element isn't really at the centre of the narrative. So I think that's maybe more of a comment, um, but that's really helpful from Chris. Thank you. Um, so another question for Mireille from Josephine. Um, I'm really interested in this sort of concluding idea that you mentioned that all of the women are the same woman. How did this interact with the ideas, uh, the idea of their individual identities slash stories? Um, well, j just before I answer jo Josephine's question, I do want to say that um, I forgot who made the comment about women at point zero, Rebecca. It's, I, I see the parallelism. It's uh, um, so Nawal Sadawi interviews, um, it's, it's based on a true story. She interviews this woman um, in Egypt who has committed murder. And um, so she's in jail. And the, the telling of, of uh, her name is Ferdaus, which ironically in Arabic means paradise and she's in jail. Um, she, it's, it's a commentary on patriarchal values and, you know, being in jail and conservative society and so on and so forth. So I could, I, I see, I see that that was a good uh, parallelism. So I just wanted to, to say that um, for the, the, inter the comments about the individuality of, you know, of the, the women in the text, um, it is within the literary tradition of women to at least from um, North African Levantine literature. So North Africa, Levantine is, you know, the, for, yeah. Um, it is very common to uh, use this metaphor as the I, as we, and the we as I, right? Like where one woman speaks for many and many women speak for one. Um, this is not to say that individuality doesn't exist. This is on the contrary. It kind of promotes a sense of sisterhood that the experiences are shared, whether well, uh, regardless of their the differences within the heart of the of the stories, the oppression is the same. It's all, it goes back to toxic masculinity, conservative religious values, traditionalism, traditionalism, patri patriarchy, so on and so forth. So, at no point this is intended to erase the individuality of these women. It's just to to, to create a bond between women, regardless of their sexual orientation, of their religion and age. There are age gaps between these women. Um, social status as well, um, and religion. If you know, if you know about the Middle East, uh, religion is a big factor that divides uh, the society. Unfortunately, so uh, the the book is a commentary on this. That these women equally come from Christianity, uh, Judaism, Islam, whatever. They're all into in in this together. So it creates a sense of sisterhood. And um, interestingly enough, the novel ends up. I don't know if I should tell you this because it's going to be a spoiler alert, but. <laughs> um, it ends up on, on two things. There's a question mark about the madness of the of the narrator at the end, and which which kind of raised the question whether she imagined all of this or not. But it's very brief at the end. But also, it also ends up with the audience and the protester protesting her performance. So she joins the shadows in the in the in the wardrobe. So the idea at the end of the book is that no matter how this is, no matter how much we speak of sisterhood, no matter how many stories we expose, the society is not ready for it. And then instead of her staying in the light, she joins into the confinement. Uh, but this does not take away um, the individualities of the story. I find it very strong in terms of sisterhood and how we speak for each other. Thank you so much. 
Um, Rebecca's got to go, but I'm going to still ask a question. And then I've just put that you could catch up with it, Rebecca, when you are available to watch um, the recording afterwards. So she's put to you, um, I'm in, this is for Marie. I'm interested oh. in the embodied nature of the shadows um, attached in inverted commas to our bodies and reflections of them while also being distorted due to different degrees of light and I was wondering whether the shadows are a comment on embodied memory and those parts of our experiences slash memories that we perhaps give out or emanate from our bodies without realizing it good question okay English is my fourth language give me a second <laughs> Don't go and take your time okay so I Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether the shadows are common on bodies, memories. I mean, yes, definitely. The the in the novel, there there are times where the the narrator slash the author behind goes in details about the description of the shadow. As I mentioned briefly, when she talks about uh, her shadow, her shadow wearing the stiletto shoes, right? It's a commentary on femininity and sexuality. Um, there are moments where she talks about shadows being shot. And there are moments where she talks about shadows um, hiding um, away from snipers and bent over and crying from pain. So definitely the shadows are an extension of physical bodies um, and definitely their carrier of meaning. It's not just like a light. Um, the one thing that is in common between all of these shadows is that when she gets them on stage, they're on full spotlight. They're exposed entirely. Um, in terms of memory, yes, there are the, as uh, Pierre Nora says, there are the lieux de mémoire. Um, so lieux de mémoire means that uh, Pierre Nora doesn't use this for the body as a commentary on the body. He uses it literally for geographical spaces. But what's interesting is that in Lebanon, uh, we don't have a official historical discourse for the Civil War. And the Civil War uh, started in 1975, ended in 1991. We don't have an official historical discourse. So the body becomes the repository, right? It becomes the space that remembers. And of course, yeah, it plays on that role of that. This remembers is in the shadow. It's not exposed entirely up um, in this society, and it varies where uh, it varies by community. And so, um, and it, the memory comes only when you are in the spotlight. But then, at the end of the novel, it goes back into the the word uh, the word uh, the wardrobe. So yes, it, it is an extension of the body. It is definitely a, a lieu de mémoire for for memory. I hope I answered that right. No, that was a brilliant answer. Thank you, Mireille. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to move on to another question from Beatrice. So straight back to you, Beatrice. And this is from Polly, who says, in response to your reference, uh, reference to the protagonist's position as a monster or object of curiosity after her release from prison, I was wondering whether these perceptions vanish altogether within the context of prison or remain to some degree. Hi, Polly. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, so I think it goes back to um, what Hannah and Chris were asking about um, in terms of, you know, what kind of solidarities exist between her and the women, um, her fellow inmates in prison. And I think kind of going back to this idea that she doesn't see the crime as a rupture necessarily with the kind of societal perception of her as a monstrous woman. Um, there's a continuation between her monstrosity as a, as a, person as a woman who doesn't have children and uh, the crime that then leads her into kind of prison there's a strange sort of criminality and transgression that just comes from being um, a woman without children and likewise she sees that there's a kind of expectation that every woman in prison is somehow transgressive and criminal and therefore um, she's not necessarily an object of curiosity in the same way that she feels when she then leaves prison so the object of curiosity with, with regarding this woman comes from the fact that she can read and write. So, you know, she gets called Ketiba by her fellow inmates, but also by the prison guards, for example. So she, that is both a sort of an identity for her, but also an act of survival because it kind of elevates her, I think, within the community. And I think that's probably a bit of a cliche when it comes to prison writing, you know, this idea that you're, you're the privileged inmate because you can read and write. But um, I think it's definitely something that she, the, the character draws um, empowerment from. Um, and so we were talking a little bit um, earlier on 
that with Hannah sorry that this idea of um because she's and, and it kind of goes back to um what Murray was saying about sort of polyphony in in North African and uh, Levantine um writing that you know you one woman's voice can also uh, embody and uh, um, sort of represent others at the same time so there, that might be something that's going on in in her prison writing um for others not her prison writing but her sort of scribe work um that she starts to sort of gather women's stories as a sort of like a record of of their voices in prison um so that kind of that that's what sets her apart as an object of curiosity not necessarily monstrosity as a murderer because every all these women have been condemned as monstrous women through their kind of criminality i'll leave it there thank you thank you beatrice I'm just going to read Nina's comment out because she put, um, this is to Mireille, fascinating about the shadows and official memory discourses in Lebanon. Performative memory seems key to both of these texts. I don't know whether you've, if you've got any other comments on that. I, I mean, I commented already, but I can elaborate. Um, so um, history, we, we know there are different ways. History and memory, they're not the same thing. And um, history, we all know that it's mostly written by by those who win the war and, and and mostly by men. Women's history do not in the past and more in the past more so now it's a little bit different. But in Lebanon, um, one, there is no official history of what happened in the war, and two, there are uh, sectional memories. There is no official history, which means that each religious group we have we have 18 religious communities in lebanon and each person you talk to may have a different memory of the war depending what political party they belong to or what sectarian sectarian group they belong to and the one common thing that is very noticeable across all these groups is that um, there are certain memories that do not make it to the public sphere they only stay in the private sphere and this is particularly true for instance for women's memories of the war more so when we talk about sexual assault, there are uh, rape cases that never have, have never seen the light in Lebanon. And when you ask Lebanese and say, uh, has rape occurred during the war, people will tell you, has it? As if it never happened and it's not true, it did. And the problem is these women's stories of war, whether they are sexual assault, torture, uh, women soldiers, so on and so forth. Now, now we're just starting to, to talk about them, but they remain in the shadow. And of course the, the writer is playing on this, that women's memories are shadows they never make it to the public sphere and when they make it to the public sphere the stage they make people uncomfortable and the you know people start protesting them um interestingly enough to link this magic realism to a reality a couple of weeks ago a lebanese woman uh passed away her um uh her name is justine Khwaidi. justine was um a Christian firefighter, some people, depending who you talk to, some people would tell you she was a terrorist, some people would tell you she's a you know, a far right conservative Christian who fought against Muslims, so on and so forth. In her funeral, depending what newspaper you read, it depends, her description varies depending what newspaper you read. And therefore her, her memory is gonna be remembered and her history, there's no one history of her, right? Her memory is gonna be remembered differently depending who you talk to. And at some point, her story is going to go back to the shadow because it's so controversial that people are like, okay, let's stop talking about her. We don't want uncomfortable conversations to happen. Can I, can I just follow up that really fascinating point, Mireille? That's so, like, I find that so interesting because I think it's a condition specifically um, around women's bodies as well because women's bodies are always symbolic of something. They're, you know, it's always... Yeah rep the you know representative of abstract ideas and so when it comes to commemorating women it's it gets it suddenly because it's doubling up on like the symbolic process because how can we represent a woman she's already representative of something else she's always all like already an allegory for something else so um and everything you said about sort of the kind of performative but um competitive memory that goes on in in, in lemon i'm obviously I'm, I'm not an expert in lemon but i think it's there's, there's similarities in, in what, what happened in uh, sort of some of the women's writing coming out from um, the Algerian Revolution, yeah. especially in Nancy Jabbar, is a very obvious example. Yeah. Um, but she chooses to avoid, she, tr she deals with that issue, especially, especially in La Femme Sans Sepulture, where she sort of yeah. explores the, the symbol of Zora Orday, who was this uh, martyr during the, re the revolution, her body disappears. So she's like, well, how do we commemorate her body that's absent? And she just chooses not to resolve it by sort of leaving 
this sort of absence in place. And, and, and maybe this corresponds with the idea of a shadow where it's like a present absence and it's intangible and but embodied at the same time. Um, oh yeah, I just love your work. It's really, really interesting. That's so, that's so great. Thank you. Thank you both so much for those interesting comments. Mireille, I just want to draw your attention to uh, Nina's comment in the chat because she's put that she's very interested in a project and give you a link yep. to memory margins and said, let's arrange to talk at some point. So. I'll, I'll write my email. So please, whoever, I mean, Nina, please contact me by email, but also I opened this, uh, it's an open invitation to all of you. If you're interested in continuing the conversation, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Um, I'd welcome any more comments, any more questions, throw them in the chat, put question in the chat box. Um, if anybody else has any other little bits to add, if any of our speakers have got any further sort of concluding comments. Can we do this again? <laughs> I think we should. We have got um, our next seminar. This is a nice way to introduce that um, our final seminar as part of this uh, triad of themes is going to be the 2nd of September, same time at 10 o'clock or ridiculously early in the morning for you poor American uh, um, viewers. And then after that, um, we're going to be moving on then into the medical humanities. Um, but we'd welcome everybody to return to us in two weeks. But um, I'll take this opportunity then to say a massive thank you to our speakers. I couldn't believe um, we put this together, um, reading your abstracts, but it's just flowed so wonderfully with the key ideas that have gone into both of your papers. And I really appreciate the dialogue and the, the, the space that we've had today to discuss these ideas. I think this is what it's about. It's about Yes, we're in the summer. We're in a bit of a difficult period at the moment as it is. And this is the space that we've got to, to carry on these fantastic academic conversations and to spark new ideas and new threads. So a huge thank you. And thank you to my co-host Jemima. I couldn't have done this without you, obviously.